Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening for those of you who are following from us from Italy. Welcome to the virtual room of the Italian Cultural Institute in New York. Uh, my name is Paolo Badlera. I'm the interim director of the Institute, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar for a conversation on the book Mother Tongue, An American Life in Italy by Wallace Wilde Menozzi. For the conversation, I am honored to have with us, the author of the book, Wallace Wildmanozzi, joining us from Parma in Italy, and Jonathan Galassi, president and publisher of Farrah Strauss and Giroux, joining us from New York. Before we start, let me first of all thank our guests for being us this afternoon. And uh, let me just say a few words of introduction. American poet, essayist, novelist, and translator, Wallace Waldminozzi has lived in Parma, Italy since 1981. She has taught in Europe in, and the US, Columbia, Boston College, Montclair State, Sarah Lawrence, among others. And among other things, and aside from Mother Tongue, reissued, reissued more than 20 years after its first publication, she is the author of The Other Side of the Tiber, 1920. 13. And she is also the author of a new forthcoming book in 2021, 2021 for Farrah Strauss entitled Silence and Silences, a highly anticipated meditation on the infinite search for meanings in silence. Jonathan Galassi is not only an important publisher, but also a great friend of Italian literature. Let me mm -hmm. just mention two recent uh, books, The Zibaldone by Giacomo Leopardi and the Ferris Strauss book of 20th century Italian poetry. And he's also an eminent translator of Italian poetry. He has spent over 25 years studying Eugenio Montale's poetry and he has published several, several collections of Montale's work. And also most more recently, an edition of The Canti by Giacomo Leopardi. So thank you again for uh, joining us um, today. Before starting, let me also remind our audience that they uh, will have a 10-15 minutes uh, period of question and answer at the end of the conversation, and they can uh, uh, write their questions using the chat function in their Zoom uh, application. So over to you, Wallace and Jonathan. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Paolo. I, um, I, it's a great joy for me to have this time to talk with Wallace. We've been friends for over a quarter century, and I've, I was immediately struck when I first read her by the depth. She's, she's not just a beautiful writer, but she's a, she's a, a profound writer. She, she's a, she ponders what she's thinking about very, very deeply. And so here, I was, I, I think this book that we're talking about, Mother Tongue, was the first thing that uh, she'll have to remind us, actually, but that we talked about uh, professionally. And I, I felt that uh, nobody had written about that the dilemma of being a an American in Italy in quite the same with quite the same commitment that Wallace had. But Wallace, tell, remind remind me how did we meet? We we met in a in a most implausibly wonderful way. We met uh, because. You sent me a note in Parma. Uh, you'd been reading journals because you were really uh, one of those open-minded editors. And you read an essay I'd written by, uh, on, on Iris Arrigo. And uh, you then said, if you write some more essays, why don't you send them to me? So uh, I, it, it was the day, it was the age of mail and <laughs> sticking stamps on things and photocopying them. 
And so uh, I sent you a few more essays, and then you sent me a little note, and it said, if you're ever in New York, or the next time you're in New York, why don't you come into my office? And, then, and so I, in those days, I was getting back to the States once a year. Airplane tickets were expensive. And um, when I did get there, I made an appointment, went in to see you, and you, we talked and you said, why don't you write a book about Parma? And it was just a, a, com a complete uh, shock in the sense that I'd never thought about writing a book about Parma. So it was really, can I do this? Do I know how to do this? This is surely the door. I'm, I'm standing in a door, so I better, I better try. Well, I'm, I, I don't remember the details of that, but I do, I do, it strikes a, uh, a chord with me that it was your, it was your interest in, in Iris Arrigo that, that lit me up because she, she was, she was something, someone I was very interested in, again, as a person who, uh, she was, American, although she grew up in Italy, she her mother was English. She, but she she was another person who converged with Italian culture in a very significant way, and um, and uh, I was always fascinated by her. So you're you're you were fascinated by her too, and that brought us together. So, and I think I was always also very intrigued by the profound um, paradox of living in another culture, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, uh, because uh, you've lived there, how many years now have you lived in Parma? More, more than 40. Yes, but you're still an American. You're not, a, you're not an Italian, right? Right, right. Although it, you know, it become it becomes harder and harder to distinguish the borders, you know, of where one starts or where one ends and what things mean. But uh, and and it was true. Uh, Iris Arrigo, surely I was drawn to her at the beginning because her her question of identity was so deep. Her father, who was a an an American, a very, very wealthy and very gifted American, he decided because of all the issues of war that he didn't want her to grow up with a sense of a nationality. He in some way wanted her to be a citizen of the world and therefore somehow represent a future. There wouldn't be identity sort of linked to nation. Unfortunately, he died when she was eight and of course, uh, she and her mother didn't send her to school, so she had a lot of, uh, sent her to school in, in any normal way. She was raised by tutors and a very elite group of people. And her identity lay at the core of uh, who she was when she finally makes a decision to marry an Italian. That's what she thinks. She thinks, oh, I'll be Italian. You know, at last I'll kind of have simplified this issue. And of course, uh, the war breaks out and, and he, he uh, is much more Italian and she feels she's much more British. And that's only the beginning of, of a very complicated set of differences. So I've been in Italy a long time and I think it's easy to say that when I first lived in Italy, I was an American, I was young, I, I was not married, I lived in Rome, and like so many people who went to Rome, uh, the, the grand tour was Italy. You felt, you felt uh, the classics, you felt the, West, the roots of Western civilization. I really uh, thought I understood Italy, but when I was married to an Italian, and when we moved to a to a small place, of course, I wasn't the same. <laughs> I wasn't the same person in terms of my identity, even in terms of roles. And so, when we 
when we got to when we got to Parma and started living in Parma, um, I realized that I was quite, I wouldn't say immature, but I was quite unaware of aspects of identity, my own identity and aspects of identity that were linked to culture in sort of collective ways. And uh, that was the beginning of a very, very long piece of uh, discovery, investigation, and ongoing sort of dialogue with others and myself. One of the most moving parts of the book to me uh, is the, your, your description of your relationship with your mother-in-law, uh, who was, you know, a woman of another generation, but uh, deeply Italian. And uh, could you tell us about her and your talk about that? Sure. Alba was a, was a person that you could in some ways see in, uh, in all those uh, early Rossellini or Fellini films, those kind of magnificent women who were heroic, who were sort of operating with very, very few uh, financial means or very few kind of supports of any sort. Um, Paolo's mother was left as a widow uh, in, in 1948, but her husband who was a doctor uh, had contra and, and sort of was serving people in the woods going out in the hor on horseback and, and helping, helping people he, uh, he was a TB doctor. He caught TB himself. TB wasn't, uh, wasn't anything that was completely curable except by a lot of proper nutrition and good kind of conditions, climate conditions, neither of which he had. Of course, a few years later, penicillin would come along and, you know, save, save the people who who had tuberculosis, but when he when he uh, contracted it, there was nothing really to do. And he leaves the family, so he won't infect them. He goes down to Naples, to a uh, where where he from which he never returns. And I was left with three small children, and uh, it's right after the war. Italy's very poor. The place it, the place is in the north. The place where they they were living at the time. Those places were bombed by the Allies. And uh, she's left with three kids and, and a mother. She's an illegitimate child herself. And she's uh, got a mother who, who she lives with, who is also quite uh, very, very hard on Alba. And she has to figure out life, which she does. She, she raises the kids, she, she moves to Parma, she builds a house, they live in, in, in sort of, the house is uh, built out of debts and promises, they take in borders. She, she gets herself a teaching uh, position, but the position is back in the mountain town, so she's commuting up and down for, the year, for years of the children's lives. She was a, a person, though, who never said no. She never, uh, she never gave up. Uh, she always believed in helping others. When there was an earthquake in, in, uh, in Friuli, she decided she should go and, and uh, cook for the people who were homeless, and she did that kind of thing. Uh, so she was an inspiring, very... Uh, very determined in her way, a person who was very fragile in another way. Uh, I not only grew to love her, I, I must say I appreciated the fact that she uh, accepted us and accepted the marriage. I don't think it was something that she had had in mind for her son, but she was, uh, she, she was very, very, um, she was very good at trying to get to know us, and we had a very good relationship by the time she died. 
how do you feel she understood the parameters of your life? You know, what you wanted, what you hoped for? I don't, I don't, I don't know. If you see this thing behind me, it's a, it's a quilt. It's a, it's a uh, quilt that was made by a great, great, great grandmother of mine. And I didn't have much to, to, to hang up or put up that was ours. But at any rate, we decided we'd, we'd hang this quilt and uh, Alba looked at it and she said, you know, he's a professor, you know, you can't hang a bedspread on the wall. <laughs> that, that would be a good, you know, a good example of a certain kind of, kind of, you know, way we saw each other. And I, I, I just, uh, so, but I think uh, that's also a good example of how open she was because from her standpoint, I think it was really hard. Uh, it, it was hard to have a friend of hers come over and think that her son had married somebody who put a bedspread on the wall, you know, so. <laughs> one of the, what would I, one of the subtexts or maybe it's not even a subtext of the book is it's really a book about women women's role in society and uh it, it's a feminist book in many ways and uh i one of the other heroines of your book is uh the abbess giovanna piacenza who uh uh ran the um what is it the abbey of san paolo is it Yes. Yes. De San Paolo. Tell tell us about her. Well, she was somebody who was just an incredible discovery for me, because uh, I didn't, I I was not able to enter into uh, a position here in Parma. I had when we left Stanford, I had I had a good job, and I was also uh, starting up. I would say as as a poet, I had a I had a relationship with Howard Moss, who was the editor at the New Yorker, and I had a relationship with John Frederick Nims, who was running poetry. And uh, and poetry, like the way you uh, in 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 the second the second life of art, the the book you translated from Montale, Montale in some ways saw that a poet couldn't expect probably to live as a poet. They had to have other things. He took up writing for journals and essays and critics. And that was the way it was for me. I, I worked always like as an editor at Stanford. I wasn't, but my real, my real work was, was poetry, but I didn't expect I could support myself as a poet. And when we came to Italy, somehow I thought I, I had always worked in Rome. I assumed in Parma I could. I, I, couldn't find, uh, I couldn't find a way in. And so in the end, I had very, very uh, long and isolating times. And it was really going to the, the convent of, of uh, the Camera di San Paolo, and which, which means the room, you know, in this convent of San Paolo, which was decorated by Correggio, and it was sponsored by Giovanna da Piacenza, who was the abbess. That particular convent had a special dispensation, which was uh, in the twelve, which was offered them in the twelfth century, and the group of women in Parma was the same, had the same freedoms that the women in Germany, for example, Hildegard of Bingham, who many, many people would recognize, this was the same group of women who in this order were allowed to be self-governing, which means they could elect the woman who was to head their group. And it meant that they could carry on different kinds of worldly activities. They ran uh, they ran their families, agricultural properties. They did lots of things, but they also decided to be patrons of the art. 
and and they sponsored different projects and the the Correggio room was sponsored by Giovanna who happened to be the last abbess uh, who who uh, ran the order which had survived for 400 years she was the last abbess who was allowed to uh, have these privileges she was then the, the, the monastery was shut down uh, and she spent her last six months kind of in, in isolation um, and in censorship. She lost uh, all, the, all the kind of liberty that they had in, in, enjoyed. And I didn't see the story when I went, went to visit the convent. It wasn't written up on the little plaques that describe you know the various objects in the in the rooms but somehow uh, I started just browsing around and out emerged this this story of Giovanna's fight and she fought three three popes for the fact that she did not feel they should be shut down she didn't want to be shut down and she was willing to to fight uh, to fight and resist. It was then that somehow, for the first time in Parma, I felt I had an ally, a sister, an American, practically somebody who was somebody who was going to stand up and uh, and resist. Then you know, it it in the in the book it develops in a way that. I think it says something about the whole book, which was once I started looking into her resistance, she took over my imagination. She was, a, she was just an incredible figure, but she was also an incredible symbol. And uh, I realized if I, if I went in a certain direction, I could, uh, I could write the whole book about her. And so, uh, so I had to pull back in, in a sense uh, and not go as, f I had to use her for my own uses, which was as a symbol of a woman who was, uh, who paid a price for her independence, but nevertheless was willing uh, to pay that price because, uh, because she believed in the, the freedom and in fact, the rights which she felt they had been offered and then were taken back. What was it, did this have to do with their interest in uh, rationalism in the, what, what, were, what were they being criticized for? Well, I think they were part of a, I think they were part of a much larger set of problems that was kind of circling the church. It was, was 15, she she commissions the thing her her work with Correggio. None of these dates is is absolutely solid. They they kind of are, they appear in in different in different volumes in different ways. And I'm certainly not the absolute authority. But around 1518, she commissions this work with Correggio, and in 1524, she's. Uh, she lo she loses the battle and is and is cloistered for the last six months of her life. So uh, it's a time when the church, uh, you know, Martin Luther has sort of set set a certain uh, set of conflicts uh, up in uh, sort of into the air and down into into Italy, and there are also other other conflicts which are bothering uh, the powers in Rome. And I think they decided her, the convent, the women were easier to shut, they don't shut down the, the equivalent con uh, sort of group of men in Parma. They do shut down the women. And it's, I think they were fighting just for the, their general survival. I think uh, they, they had had really a very rich life obviously a very open life. When you look at what Correggio painted on their ceiling, it's Tell quite- Tell us about that. What yeah, did he it's say? Quite, it, it, it's, I still can go in there and just get goosebumps in the sense of saying, this, this was 
Well, this was the Renaissance. Uh, the, here it was, right here in this room. Uh, here, here was Correggio pushing, uh, pushing the envelope, as they say. He, he painted a room which I think no one has, again, agreed on what it really means. Uh, Panofsky, I think, is considered the person who, who is quite a reliable authority on what it means. But yes, it brings in a kind of secular set of symbols. There's no Christianity in, in the room. Uh, he brings Correggio, who happens to be as advanced as, as uh, you can be in perspective, has the room, it's so three-dimensional, all, all the niches and all the columns and all the things he's doing, but it's all illusions. But all the stories are stories of fate and destiny, and they're all stories which uh, have no... Uh, no place in a way in the, in, in the orthodox of the, of the Christian dogma at, the, at that moment. Right. And he has these putti who are these mischievous little guys and he has these ram's heads who again seem to be spies, listeners, censorers, we don't know. And then, and that was the thing that was the biggest surprise for me, Looking at the fireplace, which I'd looked at a lot of times, there's Di Diana, who's sort of standing in for the abbess, and she's in her chariot, and she's holding her hands like this, and the chariot and the horse are in front of her, and the horse has his tail lifted, and her fingers are out, and so, it's quite a rude gesture. There's really, there's really no way of of, uh, of avoiding it. And so, you can see that the room, you know, the room. Either it was a, there was indeed a lot of uh, loss of control uh, in that room, or it was a rebellion. I don't think it's. But at any rate, it was a room that. Uh, she, she had a commission. And when you see it and you see how advanced the learning is in terms of perspective and, uh, and you see even the room just before it, prior to it, which is a local painter, you realize what genius is, you realize what, what the flowering of knowledge is, you see what uh, was coming alive and which was then uh, snuffed out. How is, how would you say that little parable, which is very telling, how would you see the life of Parma as a city as relating to that? Tell us about modern Parma. Is it a conformist culture? Is it a, is it, what, what was it like to be in it? What is it like to be in it? Well, I think it, it's changed, you know, the whole, as we know, as we know in the States right now too, I think we're in a phase that we wouldn't recognize from when, you know, when we were rebelling and marching around, uh, it was quite different from what there is, what's going on now or the forms it's taking. I think Parma too has opened up a great deal, uh, probably with with the technology that that has you know opened up so many things, uh, with a generation of kids, with things like the European Union, where uh, students have traveled in a way that they never did in Italy. Uh, kids, kids are leaving home. There's enough money to. Uh, to make mobility possible. And those things have all changed the city, at least at some level. Uh, I don't know. I think, in, in, I think things in Parma are, are in some ways very much, you know, very much as they have been. And mm -hmm. 
and will continue to be. But on the other hand, uh, there are changes that that make it a very different place than than it was when I, when I when I came. One of the biggest elements for me at a real simple level of change was there, there came to be the, uh, it's called the Biblioteca Internazionale Ilaria Alpi, which was named for a, a woman journalist who was, who was assassinated for her, her work uh, where, because she ran into the corruption end of it. It was in, in uh, Somalia. Uh, anyway, the International Library has made a great deal of difference um, because for the first time you can, and because of things online too, you can find, you can find books, you can find books in different languages. They run a, they run a cultural uh, reading program in German, in Russian, they have a Japanese group. There was a, a, all of a sudden a group of international uh, clusters appeared in a way that had mm -hmm. never been obvious before. Uh, and immigrants, a large number of immigrants, there are more than 40,000 40, legal immigrants that have come into Parma and they've changed the city. They've brought in food, which is different. They've brought in sort of uh, costumes that are different, costumes that are different. Um, the Pakistanis run the vegetable stands, so in those ways, Parma has, you know, changed in a more international way. Aren't you involved with uh, helping uh, Somali women in Parma? Nigerians. They Nigerian, were, I'm sorry. Nigerians. That was the kind of thing. That's a good example of, for at least two or three decades, being in Parma. If you wanted to do something as an initiative, it was very hard to find any place you could go. You need permissions, then you need you need a, you need a sponsor, even if you're going to do it as a volunteer. So, uh, once the library came in, there were many initiatives that were possible to have, and they would be the support. And so, uh -huh. and I, the, the Nigerian women became. Besides the fact that I'd had Nigeria in my novel, it had always been a country that fascinated me. The, um, I was speaking at the library for Martin Luther King Day and trying to, trying to explain uh, sort of the situation and what King meant and you know, what the situation, current situation was. And some Nigerian women attended it because they didn't speak Italian, but they did speak English. And it was from there that we developed uh, this project where, uh, where they came to write, uh, to write about their lives. Wallace, I'd, I'd like to s turn away for a, a minute and talk about what you've been doing lately and the book we're going to publish next year. Uh, called Silence and Silences. Can you uh, say a little bit about that? Sure, that was a, such a gift. I've had so many gifts from, from you and your, your interest and your support. And this was a, a few, I think this was, a, it was maybe two and a half years ago or something. Uh, you were, we were meeting for, and you asked me, you know, what I would like to do or what I was thinking I might do. And I, you get to a stage where, I, I don't know, I wasn't quite sure that what I had left to say or what, what needed to be said. And I just mentioned silence and you said, oh, that would be, that would be interesting. Why don't you send me something? And I sent something and you said, go, you know, go for it. So, so that was uh, just an amazing, an amazing gift. And having that challenge, uh, well, but also having somehow the, the light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that, that you were there and were interested in it and supportive, uh, 
I um, I started and I just found it a I found it a a topic obviously without end a topic that's attracted people at all levels um, and something that really uh, represented a step forward for me as a writer. Uh, the more I got into it, the more the more I understood about narrative uh, and the more I understood about um, what, what could and couldn't be done in terms of um, describing something that was indescribable. And also perhaps uh, committing to what it was about silence, because it is a contradiction to use words in silence. What it was about silence that I could describe that would ultimately add up to some kind of uh, experience that that might be new for readers. I didn't want to tell them what it was. I wanted them, like in poetry, in some ways, to to discover and feel what it was for them. You you mentioned in passing your novel that you wrote. Could you tell our friends about that? <laughs> that was, uh, after I wrote Mother Tongue, uh, as I said, I was not, I was not prepared for the fact that I was going to be writing about real people and, and real life. And I was deeply committed to truth. But it's quite scary to write about other people. I, as a poet, I, I, I never thought I would be talking about others and my life in that particular way that I did in terms of writing a memoir. So when I finished it, I thought, I'm going to write a novel because it'll be so much easier. I won't, you know, I won't have to worry about all this stuff. Well, that was again, typical uh, lack of knowledge on my part. Uh, Toscanelli is set in Florence, uh, where I had and have a, de a dear friend who I've, I've known since college. And so I knew Florence very, very well. And I realized again that place makes a big difference. I could never write an international novel in Parma, although Stendhal, you know, had a had a go at it in a different way in a different time. But I realized I could really talk about immigrants and I could talk about sort of the, sort of the literary ideas of Florence uh, in a way that would be far different if I set my novel in Parma. So it was set in Florence. It was set on the summer solstice. I was there with my friend to watch a ceremony celebrating Toscanelli's measurement, which is a, the, he measured a ray that comes down through a certain window and hits a meridian. And they were using measurements at the time to figure out if the Catholic Church could describe Easter as a fixed day in the same way that they did Christmas. And it just came to me all at once, basically, that this was a novel. And, uh, and that, that's what I did. I had a Nigerian prostitute in there, so an immigrant. I have a, ch a child. I have a Catholic convent. I have a, an American sand therapist. I have a tree scientist. I have an excavation of a, an Etruscan woman. So we have lots of layers, lots of levels, lots of uh, lots of lives. And my idea was that it would be a polyphonic novel. In other words, each person would have an equal voice. It wasn't like I'd let uh, the American, which is the way often the Anglo-Saxon novel goes, or the white person, or whoever it is, the protagonist take over. We were all protagonists in the novel. And uh, that was um, was a huge, a huge, a huge effort, and a wonderful thing, and certainly not what I thought it was going to be at the beginning, because I just wanted, I wanted the song to be uh, equal in terms of voices, and I think it was, uh, it was, and you helped me with that book too. Oh. I'll never forget it. I'll never, ever forget it. You've helped so many people. 
And that was, uh, it was sort of, what are you going to do with a novel? And, and, and let's go back to my office and let's, let's look at uh, small independent publishers. Let's see if, if you, can, you can find somebody who will take it on since it was such a uh, unusual novel, certainly in terms of form and, and content in a way. And you sat down, we went through lists of, of, of publishers. You, hand, you printed it all out, you know, and said, you just to get it published. And so I did. I met a, you know, in this just American process, which is, is one of America's great, great sides that opened this, if it can remain open, sending the book out and having people just read it unsolicited. And it was uh, Jeffrey Miller, Cadmus Press, out in out in uh, San Francisco. He was uh, he published Paul Bowles. He published a lot of international people. He wrote me <laughs> and said, "This is why I am an independent publisher. This is what I should publish." But you know, nobody nobody is buying these things. Nobody's interested. But and so I really pray you find another publisher for it because they do better with it than I would. But if you don't, if you don't find anybody, uh, I'll do it. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to, uh, we should have questions in a minute, but uh, there's one question I should have asked you at the beginning, which I didn't, which is tell us about the title of Mother, Mother Tongue. What is the, where does that come from? How does that relate to the themes of, of the book. It's about language, of course, about maternal being, but tell, tell us more about that. I think, I think you put your finger on, yeah, you put your finger definitely on, on the fact of, of mothering, motherhood. Uh, what I was learning, I think, from living in Italy and also I think what I missed about being uh, perhaps a Protestant uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, person. I, there was something in the mother image that I found in Italy that always remained fascinating to me. Language, of course, the fact that um, however, however fluent I became, however uh, deeply I got involved with the language, there is a kind of basic and emotional language that carries the culture and the feelings. And somehow for, for me, uh, it was English, not, not the English. There was a part of English that had excluded women writers and excluded uh, women in, in many activities. But there was an English uh, language that at least had always been um, clear, clear to me. It was an inner language, and uh, it was that that I very much wanted to to express. And I realized, I mean, I could only do it in English. I I would never have the depth. I could I could ask you. I mean, you know the depth of Italian. It would be almost. Uh, impossible, at least for me, to, to consider writing in, in, in any way that was, was, was acceptable. Well, I, I've, I, one thing that I loved about the book and still love is the, is the way you, while being who you are and and uh, reflecting your own background and your own um, Americanness, you're also very deeply uh, aware of and appreciative of the, how would I say, the altruistic nature of Italian life. Um, and to me that the maternal uh, um, factor is, is essential to that, the image of the 
of Mary, of the Virgin, of the of the Mother, the Holy Mother, and all is so so intrinsic to how Italians see life. Really, yeah. that's part of it. I think. Nourishing, 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 and uh, and I think it it's in every it it it's in. I mean, Natalia Ginsburg, who was. Uh, just, just an example of, of a woman who was so rounded, you know, in terms of being a mother, being an, an intellectual, being a social person, being somebody who, who liked to cook, being a domestic. And she, she, living in Italy that way was truly, uh, truly profound. There was a lot of support for expanding uh, what it means to be a woman. Uh, exactly. I, Paolo, sh shall we have questions now? Would you like to? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think people are asking. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me start from uh, uh, Roger Lowenstein. We're now senior citizens in a generation that thought we would be young forever. We are especially at risk for COVID-19. How has that unhappy reality shaped your aesthetic sensibility or your worldview? Not an easy question. Who, 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 do, who do you want to answer it? Both of us? Please. No, you answer, you answer. Oh, I, I can say that living in Italy through this phase, because we were really in lockdown, I was very, very, very proud to be in Italy. I think, I think the response uh, at a collective level where the leadership too appealed to us not as individuals who might have to sacrifice here or there, but that we would have to think of the collectivity and that we were gonna accept some limits so that we could ultimately get out without, with, with less sacrifice of lives, that we would have to share things, that we wouldn't have everything our way. I was so grateful for that response. And I think the media, every single night, sort of stressed people's generosity, people's, uh, all the healthcare workers, uh, the kind of stories, they, they showed us a lot of suffering. They showed us a lot of, uh, a lot of lack. They showed, uh, they explained to us the viruses. They showed how, how it's going to be difficult to get the vaccines out. They stressed, they've already passed the fact that everyone is to have the vaccine free. These things were, were great uh, sources of consolation in this period that's been very tough and disorienting. There was somehow we felt we were being led and that we would get out of it if we could be uh, accepting of a collective response. Good. Um, next question from Karen in France, speaking of international uh, audiences. Uh, do you find any of that rebellion of the abbess in Parma today, or is it more the conservative shut it down attitude that one feels nowadays trying to accomplish something out of the norms? I think, uh, I think it's hard to generalize, I th but I think uh, there's a lot of the spirit, because I mean, partly Giovanna is, is, could be narrated, I suspect, many ways. And certainly if we, we used all the historical details, it'd be a more complicated story. But that kind of fiery side of Giovanna, the fiery side that was, I think you can still see that in people. I think, uh, I don't think it's, I think in the Parma person, there, there, there is a strong uh, strand, uh, some might call it anarchy, but uh, there's, a strong, there's a strong strain of, uh, of, of standing up for certain kinds of things if it's necessary. 
Um, there was a question for Jonathan. Do you want to uh, read that question, Jonathan, or should we skip it? Well, I answered it in the chat. Uh, it's about whether we should have had an index in the book, given the, sure the density. Is that the one you mean? Yeah, I, I'm not sure everybody can uh, saw. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the, the uh, person said, um, as publisher of this book that you've described as deep, and I would add dense and detailed in its engagement with history, did you consider adding an index? And I answered, we thought of it as a personal testament, though it does have a historical dimension, maybe we should have. Uh, from uh, Marina and Roger in Boston, can you talk more about your forthcoming book on silences in music have purposes? I don't understand. Are you exploring these ideas in other mediums? So is this, uh, are you um, exploring silences in music? I guess that's basically the question. Well, you, we, have, we have to take at least John Cage and start <laughs> start from there there's a sure they're 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 different uh they're, they're different an anecdotes and different approaches to the fact that really there's there are infinite ways to look at silence and we do we do i do uh, as i said look at a, a few in music and of course a lot in art and basically even more than that the silences in people's lives either because they voluntarily choose uh, to keep things silent, either because they're unaware of things and then discover them, but it's, it's infinite. But yeah, there's a little bit on music, but I'm, I'm not a, uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a exhausted, I'm not exhausting the topic in this book, but Cage certainly comes in and a man named Brunello, who's a, who's a, who's a cellist in Italy, he wrote a book on silence and music and I, I bring him up. Next question from Stefania in New York. Would you say that because Italian is not your mother tongue, you will always feel a foreigner in Italy or are there other connections that make you feel Italian? I think that's just, <laughs> That's true of, you know, it, it's true of anybody. Some, sometimes, uh, sometimes when we listen to an opera in Italian and we don't understand a word, we're just uh, wiped out in terms of the emotion and the feeling. And sometimes in Italian, I could not be closer to who I am or what, what I understand at a certain moment. If I must, Straniera here, it's because I have an accent, because I'm six feet tall, because I don't look, I don't look like a Parmigiano. In, uh, but, you know, I think at a certain point, those things dissolve. Uh, I, when I came to Parma, I was a different person than I am now. I can't, I can't explain it or reduce it to the fact that I've grown older or I've grown more this or more that or this. We change, we change and I've been deeply enriched by living in a, another culture, in absorbing it, but also in understanding difference, in standing up for differences in others, in noticing how important difference is to, to, um, to protect to express, uh, but also to to let go of it. You know, it's a it's a it's a very dynamic thing. But sure, I will never. I, I, I had a nice exchange with Tim Parks, and he and I accepted. And Tim Parks is has a lot more depth in terms of uh, Italian than I do. Uh, the fact that we would never write in Italian because Italian feeds our English and makes it very, very rich indeed. But somehow what we draw on as our kind of core identity is still our mother tongue. Great. Um, I have one question. Um, going back to the beginning of the conversation, 
when you mentioned Iris Origo, um, uh, are there uh, Italian female authors, scrittrici, who you are reading, you have read, you know, it, this is the era of Elena Ferrante, and, but I think there are several Italian women writers who uh, should, are over underestimated and they should be uh, explored and read more. Or, I, and, sorry, and the, the last part of the question is, uh, have you been influenced by reading those authors? Well, I think, again, it, it, I, one could go in so many directions. Er, early on, uh, I, it, was, uh, it was Marilyn Hacker, when she was editor of the Kenyan Review, asked me to write an essay on Natalie Ginsburg. And I read all her work. I read 5,000 pages of, of her work. And uh, it was a wonderful experience, just, just wonderful. Because uh, as I said, I, lear I, 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 learned, uh, I learned so many things about writing, about narrative, about an Italian, uh, her life, and, and so on. And I think uh, her, her thought and her work uh, became part of me in, in many ways. I've read a lot of Italian women and men. Uh, and I, as you know, the big phenomenon has, has been uh, Elena Ferrante with you know, a, lot of, a lot of comments in a lot of different directions. Um, but I would say if I've been influenced by people, if I, I am drawn very close to a writer if I have to do translation. And so, uh, for example, I did a project on three uh, contemporary Italian women poets, Elisa Biagini, Antonella Aneda, Maria Angela Gualtieri, and uh, I, f I found it just wonderful work. I, f I found touching every word, seeing, uh, seeing what they were doing, what they were just, what, what the uh, sort of uh, fabrics were that they were trying to weave. Um, I felt an em enormous uh, respect, as I do for many uh, Italian writers, an enormous respect for the the amount of learning, imagination, uh, and culture. But these three women poets, I really found they, they moved me emotionally too. I really liked what they were describing. Thank you. Um, I think we are uh, approaching the, the end of this uh, uh, conversation webinar. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything you would like to add before we close? Uh I would just like to thank Wallace for sharing her uh, wisdom with us. And you can see from, you can hear from listening to her speak how deeply she uh, engages with the, her situation. Uh, I recommend her work to everyone. Uh, I absolutely love her writing and I love her. So thank you all for listening. Uh, thanks. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I need, I need to ask one final thing. And you and you have like 60 seconds to answer. <laughs> Someone wants to uh, would like to know more about Parma or visit Parma. Can you recommend a movie, a book, and or a place they should visit? Oh, well, you should read the Charter House of Parma by Stendhal and see what, what, what's real and what's not real in that <laughs> book. I think, uh, I think Bertolucci, the filmmaker who, who basically has roots in Parma and in this whole area, Novecento is a film as rough as it is in contrast with uh, 
The tree of the wooden clogs, which is another version of agricultural life. I think watching that Bertolucci film is uh, would give you quite quite a quite a bit of understanding of a certain view of Parma. Verdi is somebody you should listen to, and you get a you get you'd get a lot of feelings for the the, the, the people and the positions here. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wallace. Thank Thanks. you, Jonathan. And Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks to everybody. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. ciao. Start again. Ciao. Buonasera. Buonasera. Buonasera a tutti.